In August, we highlighted legislation approved by state lawmakers designed to impose new regulations on automobile brokers who are classified by the state as someone accepting a fee or commission to arrange or assist in the purchasing or leasing of a car, a practice that has reportedly been on the rise in recent years. Since we previously heard from the assembly sponsor of the measure, we're now going to get an opposite voice. And to do that, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Sloan Schickler, an attorney representing the New York Automobile Leasing Broker. Association. Welcome to the show, Sloan. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's our pleasure. So for listeners who haven't utilized an automobile broker, when are they typically employed and what services do they provide in the course of leasing or purchasing an automobile? Typically what happens is someone wants to buy or lease a vehicle And instead of going out to the dealer themselves, they just call a broker and ask them for help. They usually give a description of the type of vehicle they're looking for, let's say an SUV that seats five people, seven people, whatever. And then the broker will search for a vehicle that meets their needs. And the broker usually would try to help them obtain the best vehicle uh, for their needs. That includes the best possible transaction available. The brokers are not limited to one make or model. They can work with any dealership and therefore the customer or consumer gets the benefit of being able to have a range of vehicles selected from different manufacturers and the prices may vary as a result. And are there certain clientele who might gravitate toward a broker? Because for a lot of people, I have to imagine they're comfortable doing a Google search or maybe making uh, calls to various dealers. So is there someone who might gravitate toward a broker? There are a lot of people that first of all, are intimidated about going out to a dealership to get a vehicle. And many people don't have access to Google or are not fluent. English may be their second language. There are a lot of brokers that work in minority communities across New York, in the Afro-American community, Hispanic and Asian communities, as well as certain religious minorities. There are also customers that have specific needs with with respect to disabilities and are looking for vehicles to be outfitted in a certain way, and the brokers are able to help them with that as well. Right now, what state rules or regulations govern automobile brokers? And for example, are they required to be licensed by any sort of entity in the state? There's been law in place for many years prior to this current legislation that that was proposed, which requires brokers to be licensed in the state of New York. And at this time, there are almost 400 licensed automobile brokers in the state of New York. And is this a unique license for brokers or does it fall under some broader licensing that includes other maybe similar professions as well? This is particular to automobile brokers. It's under regulations, the vehicle and traffic law, which also requires licensing of motor vehicle dealers. So the legislation that moved through Albany this spring includes language that appears to require a broker be paid either by the dealer or the person who's obtaining a car, either through purchase or a leasing agreement, and not get paid by both of these entities, which seems to make sense in terms of the broker having a fiduciary responsibility for uh, the person trying to obtain a car. Right now, how do brokers get paid? And and are there circumstances where both the dealer and the person obtaining a car will be uh, on the hook for their costs? Well, it's interesting that you raise the question. In fact, the law was amended in 2017 uh, to recognize that brokers sometimes get paid by the consumer and sometimes get paid by the dealer. 
the thought process is really that it depends upon the, the transaction and how it transpires. What most often occurs is that the customer does not actually agree to take a vehicle, any particular vehicle, until delivery of the actual vehicle. The delivery is at the dealership. It's the broker who's acted as an intermediary to arrange the transaction. Now, sometimes what happens at the last minute, the, the customer comes in and he sees the car and he says, I need some other items. And this changes the cost of the car. And because the customer has already been quoted a price, the cost of the car is not going to change the, to the customer. And therefore, it may happen that as the deal has been arranged, it's necessary in order for the broker to be compensated that some of the compensation comes out of what the customer is paying upfront as the cash on delivery, or else uh, the balance can be paid by the dealer. And this is really on a case by case basis. And what the dealers in the market have seen is this shifted greatly during the pandemic as there were more and more transactions that were, you know, completely created by telephone and documentation prepared without the customer coming into the shop multiple times, et cetera. So aside from the type of circumstance you've laid out though, do you feel like it does make sense to, broadly speaking, restrict a broker's ability to get paid by both the car dealer and the person no. obtaining a car? No? No. I, 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 in fact, I have received no logical explanation from the lawmakers on this topic. Well, wouldn't it be that you have a fiduciary responsibility, though you're looking to just get paid by the person whose interests you're representing and not both parties involved? I don't know that you would characterize it as a fiduciary obligation because the broker is not the one that is collecting the funds. And, and in general, it's the dealer that receives all of the payments. So if there's any fiduciary, it would be on the dealer's part. And in fact, if there is for the lease of a vehicle, or if there is a retail installment sale for the sale of the vehicle, both of those documents are governed by New York law in terms of disclosures required. And New York law requires the leases and the retail installment contracts to also comply with federal disclosure laws. And all of those disclosure laws, New York and federal law with respect to leases and retail installment contracts require the contracts and the leases to disclose the broker's fee. So if the consumer is entering into that kind of transaction, it should be laid out in the lease or the contract. In general, it appears those forms are not completed with the information about the brokers and the brokers' fees. However, you should understand that it is the dealer and only the dealer that prepares the leases and the retail installment contracts. It is never the broker. The broker doesn't have the documentation. The dealer is the one that takes all of the lessee or the purchaser's personal information and submits it for financing purposes and prepares the lease or contract documentation. So they should be making the disclosures on those forms. I do not understand how limiting how the broker gets paid makes any difference to the consumer. Well, I guess, and this will be the last point on this, that the broker maybe has an expectation on behalf of the consumer to get the lowest possible price, which you might not have as one of your interests if the dealer is also paying you. But we've already touched on that. And I'm curious how you think about the uh, 
allegations from the assembly sponsor that the automobile brokers who you've described essentially as middlemen have represented themselves or misrepresented themselves, according to the assembly sponsor, as dealerships in some situations, which he says has caused confusion for customers and something I guess is understandable given what you just mentioned about, say, who's responsible for certain paperwork. So are you concerned about bad actors who are maybe misrepresenting themselves and thus precipitates the need for additional transparency? Or do you feel like those types of situations are overblown or maybe not happening with the frequency that they're alleged to have happened and thus the existing framework works? All the brokers that are licensed and running a legitimate business and caring about their customers are opposed to anyone that would be doing something wrong. Bad apples are not, are not good for business. The fact of the matter is the broker's business is a word of mouth business. The customers have been coming back to them for years. The business as was portrayed to you was allegedly on the rise, but this is a business that's been in New York State since the late 1970s or early 1980s with the advent of the vehicle leasing boom in, in this country, it developed here. There are almost 400 licensed brokers in New York and they comply with the licensing laws. The second thing is we've done an extensive search in the New York State court dockets, we've looked at the attorney general's opinions. There are no complaints against the brokers, none. And if you look at the memo of the assembly sponsor and the Senate sponsor for this bill in our legislature, they do not point to any specific acts of wrongdoing on the part of brokers. But it's interesting because this spring, in fact, the attorney general made settlements with motor vehicle dealers for acting fraudulently at least termination with customers was multiple settlements with about five different dealers in Long Island. The other interesting thing to note is that every year, the vehicle dealers appear on the top 10 list of the attorney general's fraudulent businesses in New York State. In 2023, the motor vehicle dealers were number three on the AG's hit list, and that was a 37.2% increase over fraudulent activities in 2022. I have found no instances where consumers have complained that brokers have defrauded them in any manner, nor has anyone in the legislature who was a proponent or sponsor of this bill shown anything. Well, finally, the assembly sponsor argues that his intention uh, is not to drive automobile brokers out of business. But what's your sense of the ability of brokers to operate under the framework that would be imposed by this bill if it became law? We see this as very as an anti-competitive. The drafter of the bill wanted to prevent the brokers from being paid. And once you prevent the brokers from being paid, they are not going to do business in New York State. They will not be able to, to survive here. And that's a shame because many of them have been in business for 40 years or more. They have multiple employees, up to 40 employees in some of their offices. And, and it's a shame to be putting a business out of business that brings revenue into New York State. And, and just to correct something for the record, the, the vehicles that are purchased or leased by brokers bring revenue to New York State because the sales tax that's charged on the vehicle transactions is paid to New York State when the vehicle is registered. So whether it's purchased um, by a dealer in New York City or from a dealer in Albany or any other part of New York State, the sales tax always 
is is collected and is is a part a part of the transaction that brings revenue into the state. It doesn't leave the state for any reason because just because a broker is involved in the transaction. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave things there. We've been speaking with Sloan Schickler. They're an attorney representing the New York Automobile Leasing Brokers Association. Sloan, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.